program is from A, the National Educational Television Network. NET Journal, a look at the events and issues of the world today. At the wheel of this car is a man torn between two worlds. He's an Arab sheikh who was born in an old Arabia and will die in a new one. He worships Allah, loves the desert, and is one of the richest men in the world. His name is Zaid. <laughs> Zaid rules a little kingdom in Arabia called Abu Dhabi. 20,000 people in a stretch of sand and salt flats about half the size of Denmark. To the tribesmen who follow him everywhere, he's the undisputed boss. His forefathers ruled the desert from the back of a camel. He rides it in a limousine. But he remains as they were the center of tribal life. He's the man you serve the man you hunt with, and the man you fight for. Above all, he's the man who leads. Wherever Zaid goes, his men go too. Those who don't travel with Zaid come out of the desert to greet him. They all owe their loyalty to him, and they all expect rewards from him. Zaid's tastes have not been influenced much by his money. He likes the simple life, to drive himself, to go hunting and camping in the desert, to be with his people as a sheikh should be, to follow the ways of the old Arabia. <laughs> Five or six years ago, the people of Abu Dhabi were sunk in the poverty of a thousand years or more. The 20th century had passed them by. Today, their ruler, Zaid, is one of Arabia's nouveau riche, who's acquired overnight a fortune from oil. His income could give $5,000 a year to every man, woman and child in the place, enough to make Zaid a multimillionaire. Superficially, the old customs are unchanged. The tent goes up as it always did. The food is prepared as simply as before. <laughs> Zaid's natural pace is leisurely, almost indolent. Time is about the only thing the desert's been rich in until now. Time for coffee. Time for talk, time made into ritual from century to century, from morning till night.
These girls will swing their hair, and these men will chant hour after hour. In the desert, there's no rush. At least, that's how it used to be. But Zaid, with his money, has begun to learn better. In this palace in Abu Dhabi, Zaid had a brother. His name was Shakput, and for more than 30 years he ruled Abu Dhabi in poverty and comparative peace. Shakput's rule was traditional. His word was law, but he stayed close to his people. Anyone was free to talk to him any day in the Majlis, the tribal council, and as long as they had no money, they were all relatively contented. And then in the 1960s, Abu Dhabi struck it rich and its trouble started. In a year or two, people were demonstrating about work and wages who'd never had either in their lives before. The grumbles grew as the money mounted, because Shackwood was a miser. All his life, he'd been a poor man. Now that he was rich, the skin flint habits stuck. And like a man who's won first prize in a lottery, he found his money made few friends. People began to say his brother, Zaid, would be a better ruler. He had a mind more open to the world. He was generous. He was a man's man. But Zaid had sworn to his mother years ago that he would never harm Shackwood. And for five more years, he stayed loyal. And the people waited. The oil flowed. The money poured in, but Shackwood wouldn't spend it. He was paralyzed by habit, suspicion, and downright fear. He knew the harsh old world of Arabia. He couldn't meet the challenge of the rich new one. By 1966, just five years after oil had first been found in Abu Dhabi, Shackwood's wealth destroyed him. Zaid sent him into exile and took command himself, ready to say farewell to the old Arabia. But how was he going to do it? Even with a new ruler, the old life still goes on. A timeless, patient life, dominated by the desert and the unforgiving sun. Arabia is a land of terrible heat and terrible bareness. A tract of desert as big as Western Europe, practically untouched by the world until a few years ago. To anybody who doesn't live there, it seems a land of mystery and romance, full of the exotic promise of the veil. There are still people who think of it as the land of harems and the Arabians. In reality, it's a harsh and lonely place. Only water makes Arabia bearable. Where there's water, there's life. Water is so important that the Arabian oasis became the direct inspiration of the Muslim idea of heaven. And no wonder, when you come to the cool shade of the date gardens after the heat and emptiness of the desert, the oasis seems literally heavenly, a place of pure pleasure.
every well in the desert is like a port. The camel caravans cross the desert like ships cross the sea. There are no frontiers, no fixed territory, no land belonging to anyone. There are just the wandering Bedouin and their camels, as attached to each other as sailors and their ships, bringing their trade to the desert markets. It's a hard life in Arabia, and it breeds hard men, but it's as perfectly adjusted now to the hard land it's lived in as it was in the days of Abraham, the father of all the tribes. There's still a sort of biblical rhythm about it. If you want to know what the loaves looked like in the Bible parable, here they are, baking in Arabia today, just as they did 2,000 years ago on the shores of Galilee. And I don't suppose the fish have changed much either. <coughs> the women of Arabia still hide behind the veil, as Arabia itself has done for centuries. Around the coasts, the Arab boats are made today by hand and eye and ancient equipment, much as they were when the spice trade and the slave trade kept them busy from China to the shores of Africa. To the Arabs, the sea was a source of wealth that the barren land could not provide. Fishing, curling, trading, smuggling, and especially piracy. Arab sailors in the Indian Ocean and the Persian Gulf preyed on the ships of Europe in the Indian trade. In the end, their piracy was their downfall. With a few naval sloops and some of the queerest treaties ever devised by man, the British Empire imposed on two-thirds of Arabia's coast the thin red line of peace. But neither the empire nor peace got much further than that. The sea was all anybody cared about. As long as that was safe, the land could rot. And so it did, in neglect and perpetual tribal warfare. Beyond the coast, most of Arabia lay untouched until 20 years ago. God is great. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. The religion of Arabia, by tradition, is as forbidding as the land. It's nearly 14 centuries since Arabia was the birthplace of Islam, but it's still the home of the most devoted of all the followers of Muhammad. Islam means submission to the will of God. In the desert, there isn't much you can do but submit and pray for God's mercy. Submission makes everyone equal. A ruler like Zaid is no different from other men in the sight of God. He submits like them, and wherever he is, he prays like them, and with them too. Allahu Akbar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. The Prophet decreed that the faithful must pray five times a day from dawn to dusk. You can pray together or alone, with a priest or without one. But your submission to God is complete. You're his slave. And you can count on your fingers like a rosary in 99 different ways. May God be praised. May God be praised. May God be praised. Oil has 
has ended the centuries of Arabian isolation. Oil means money. It's worth nearly $6,000 million a year around the Persian Gulf alone. And although most of the Arabian oil fields have been in production less than 20 years, their wealth is cracking the old life of Arabia wide open. To most of us, oil may be just the stuff that drives the car. To Arabia, it's a revolution. There isn't a thing it leaves untouched. It makes the desert rich. It brings the prospectors and the lawyers and the map makers to divide it. For the first time in history, oil brings soldiers to enforce peace inside Arabia. Frontiers need soldiers to patrol them. Prospectors need soldiers to protect them. So the tribesmen who once fought each other and raided the ships and commerce of the world are paid and trained as soldiers to maintain the new law. The poachers of a thousand years have been turned in a generation into gamekeepers. Two hundred and forty-five, sir. Two four five. Money begins to make its mark everywhere. The sheikh gets millions. The soldier only a scrap, but it buys a new life for both of them. 302, sir. 302. 's trip, Zaid chases the desert game with a string of falcons as long as his purse. Twenty years ago he'd probably have gone hunting on foot with only a few birds to help him. Now he takes anything up to a hundred. Each of Zaid's followers has a falcon to look after. They train them, stroke them, talk to them, practically sleep with them. Like racehorses, they're the pampered darlings of a rich man's camp. And like racehorses, they cost big money. A good bird will fetch $600 or more imported from Syria or Iraq. And with so much oil money in Arabia now, the price is rising every year. Nothing escapes the touch of money. Money changes all relationships. When Zaid visits his neighbors now, 
the traditional feast for a visitor becomes an offering to a wealthy benefactor instead. Unlike many of Arabia's oil millionaires, Zaid believes in sharing his wealth. He told me once, the oil business is like a lottery. I might still be poor and my neighbors might be rich, so we ought to help each other. He's already given away millions. Zaid's host at this feast was one of his poorest neighbors. But now that Zaid has touched his palm with silver, he won't be quite so poor. <laughs> The feast is traditional, goat's meat, chicken and rice. And when the VIPs are finished, the lesser men move in. It's always the custom in Arabia for the poor to eat at the rich man's table, or rather, off the rich man's floor. When this lot are finished, there'll still be more to come, in descending order of rank and ascending order of hunger. It's not the most elegant spectacle, and it's not the choicest food, but in a harsh and hungry land, any excuse is welcome for a blowout, especially when it's held for a man with money. The old Arabia pulls at the heart. The world where Zaid was raised, and where he always likes to be, around the campfire in the cool desert night, among his men, listening to those endless Arab fairy tales that the audience knows as well as the storyteller of love and beauty and the thousand and one nights. When the hunting's over and the caravan's resting, this is how they've passed the time for a thousand years. This is the old and sometimes beautiful Arabia, where time is endless and patience more so. <laughs> but in the new Arabia, time is money, and that pulls at the purse strings. This is the Arabia of the air-conditioned desert, the sanitized, sterilized caravan of the 20th century with its international wealth and international accents. You can't play fool, let's play darts. <laughs> I, I can play darts. For these people, the old Arabia hardly exists. The mystery and the romance, or the harshness and the poverty, it's all won in the oil company's pay packet. You See you guys later. Right. To them, Bye. Arabia is just another job. The fairy tale is over and everyone now will live happily ever after in the dream world of the Arabian Nights. But in the real world of Arabia tomorrow, it's not so easy. Not even Zaid's best friends can promise him a happy ending to his modern fairy tale that's only just begun. You can't reconcile the old life with a hundred million dollars a year, as his brother Shackwood learned. You can't even choose whether you'll have the old life or the new. God and the oil business have already chosen for you. From now on, you can only try to ride the terrible tiger of the 20th century and wonder if it will not eat you in the end.
by the international jets and the local runabouts, the vultures of world commerce descend on Zide's little kingdom. They're perfectly decent vultures, just bankers and businessmen doing their job. A hundred million dollars a year is a nice piece of export market to get your hands on, especially when the place so obviously needs your help. Ten years ago, when I first came to Abu Dhabi, there was only one plane a week. Now there's more than one a day, and the old place can't quite cope. We've been here before. Well, there's been quite some improvement uh, here in four years since I've been here. Uh, you know, I fully expect to see some floor shows when I get on into town. <laughs> With some strip teas also? No, well, no, that's a little too much. <laughs> In Abu Dhabi town, at first sight, there isn't much sign of change. Shackfoot's static rule left the town nearly as squalid as it always had been. And some of these people hardly know yet what's going to hit them. Now Zaid's ready to spend his millions. The alleys are still dark and dirty. The beggars wait patiently for the faithful Muslims to do their duty as the Prophet ordained and give them arms. This is what Arabs call the souk, the bazaar or marketplace. And in Abu Dhabi, it's Bond Street and Fifth Avenue and the neighborhood supermarket all rolled into one. <laughs> For the Arabs of the desert, it's got everything we mean by bright lights and the big city. It's not much of a place, but this is where 20,000 people are going to share Zaid's inheritance of 100 million a year. Some of them have got a share in it already. They've bought big cars to go bumping over the unmade tracks. Big lorries to cash in on the building boom. And they've also learned to throw them away, like all good modern men. There are four and five floor office blocks instead of shanties. And concrete instead of mud. The modern world, our world, is taking over. I remember, for instance, not long ago, when there wasn't a single bank in Abu Dhabi. Now, these buildings are all banks. Money in the bank means money to buy with. And the beach at Abu Dhabi is piled with purchases. Abu Dhabi was built on a sandbank, so it's never had a proper harbour. But that didn't matter much when there was nothing but a few dates to ship out and a few tins to ship in. Now the whole modern world is dumped into the sand. Air conditioners and deep freezers, timber and steel, cement and typewriters, fans and filing cabinets. You name it and you'll find it here, sweeping in like a tidal wave on the old Arabian shore. call these construction machines. They're also weapons of destruction. They can rip up an old road or knock down an old house even faster than they can build new ones. And in Arabia now they can and do tear an old way of life to shreds before a new one has properly begun. Not that many Arabs object. In fact, most of them are only too glad to help with the destruction of their old way of life. They can see the vision of a better life in a bulldozer and they want a piece of it. Someone, though, must try to strike a balance between building the new and wrecking the old. That someone is the ruler, Zaid.
Zide knows from experience that if he's too slow to destroy the old world, he may be removed like his brother Shackwood. But if he tries to build the new world too quickly, he may destroy himself just as surely. Life for Zide has become a perpetual balancing act between the personal leadership of the past and the faceless, impersonal administration of the future. Like Shackwood, he still holds his majlis every day so that his people can meet him, greet him, talk to him and complain to him in the traditional desert way. The ritual is unchanged, the coffee is served. Time, motion and people seem as leisurely as ever. But behind the appearance of tradition, the revolution is creeping in. The majlis doesn't last all morning anymore. Zaid can only give his people an hour of his time. And even that's interrupted by the demands of the modern world. <laughs> Welcome to the international businessmen. Welcome to the salesmen, to the experts, to science and high finance. Maybe welcome to the con men too, until Zaid learns to pick them from the rest. Of course, they all sit down together. And of course, they're all equal, East and West, the world and Arabia, the courtesies of the old world, mingling with the business of the new. But it's the newcomers in business suits who get the places of honor at Zaid's side. And not just because Arab hospitality demands they should be favored. They're there because they represent power. The power to provide the people of Abu Dhabi with anything Zaid can now afford to buy. Still, the ritual goes on, balancing the new with the old. The first thing a visitor must do in Arabia is to learn patience. You can sit for hours in places like this and never do anything but ask after each other's health all in good time and all by the will of God. Never do today what you can put off till tomorrow. Never act if you can talk instead. The tribesman with a problem comes to Zaid to sort it out. And everybody else must wait. Patience and still more patience. But now there's a hundred million dollars of good hard cash burning a hole in patience every year. That's business that won't wait. It may be the will of God that's given it to Abu Dhabi, but it's the will of man and especially the will of Zion that has to decide what to do with it now. Five years after the oil began to flow, Abu Dhabi got nothing but piecemeal changes. Now Zaid has come to power with a plan to make Abu Dhabi the model state of Arabia with all the paraphernalia of development. In the first few months of his rule, he awarded $70 million worth of contracts. And he's out every day to spur on the men who are making him a brand new kingdom. This will be going out the box in the mile. And the second stage, which will be done next spring or next summer, whenever your highness decides, uh, would continue on out into the very deep water for the large freighters, the large ships. <laughs> Machines that come ashore on the beach are pounding the desert into new shapes. The men who descend from the aeroplanes are drafting a new world. You are working night shift also? Yes, day and night. It's a world where time and opportunity have changed places. 
Yesterday, time seemed endless and the opportunities few. Today, time is short and the opportunities are infinite. Going out for approximately a mile, uh, which we had discussed with you in your office when Mr. Griesbach, our uh, design engineer, was here a month ago. Zaid told me once he didn't know what would happen in 10 years' time, but he felt he must give everything to his people now because they'd had nothing for so long. Schools and hospitals, wells and houses, an artificial deep water harbor to replace the Abu Dhabi beach, a four-lane highway and a water pipeline across the desert, an airport with a runway longer than London's. This is just the location of it. Now, uh, you are approximately in this area here, Your Excellency, uh, Your Highness, and uh, as we're going down the road... Of course it'll change everything. Zaid's told me that too. The first thing to go, he said, would be the Arab's love for his camel. But what's a camel to a VC-10? Oh, he would, he would take... Uh, very easily, four or five of the big fizzy tents. Of course, the smaller of the DC-3s would take quite a few. Uh, see, one of the difficulty things that uh, we don't know how many aircraft will be coming in here, Your Highness, and this is one of the things which uh, you yourself will have to decide how many airlines you'll permit to come into Abu Dhabi. And this will, of course, govern the number of aircraft here at any one time. Decide. Choose. Act. Sometimes, under these new imperatives, Zaid acts pretty hastily and harshly. He dismissed this plan for a new souk in Abu Dhabi with scarcely a moment's thought. No, 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 never, never, never. Take it away and start again. So two months' work is demolished in a moment. He who pays the piper calls the tune. In the courtyard of Zaid's palace, the centuries slide back again. A moment ago, Zaid was the modern oil tycoon, aloof and decisive. Now he's back in the role of sheikh, the universal uncle to his people, the feudal lord with his followers, in procession to the daily feast. <laughs> to the tribesmen of the desert, used to bread and dates in the sand, Zaid's table is a revelation. It's loaded with more food than many of them have ever seen, and it really is a table, and not just the floor. The idea of a free meal for all Zaid's followers is traditional, and he rarely sits down with less than 50 men. But the forms and the food are new. Money talks here through waiters in black ties, through plates and soup spoons, and a whole new ritual of table manners to master. Like the newly rich in any part of the world, the Arabs of Abu Dhabi are learning to keep up with the Joneses. Snobbery is the latest local vice. While the fathers learn new manners, a few of their sons learn new tongues. Foreign languages and foreign teachers bring foreign ideas. 
that's the ceiling. Yes. This is the floor. Good. Here's a pencil. Good. Here's a ruler. Good. There's a picture. Say it again. Good. You know, all together, stand up. Yes? That's the window. Huh. That's, that's the, the window. window. That's the door. That's the ceiling. This is the floor. Here's a pencil. Here's a ruler. There's a picture. Say it again. ليلا انشقت السماء وكانت فبأيانا يا ربكما تكذبان. But the old ways are still the only ways for most of Arabia's children. Schools like this, where the boys learn the Holy Quran by heart, haven't changed in a thousand years. It's still the only sort of school most kids ever see, if they're lucky enough to see a school at all. The romance of the old Arabia was always a bit of an illusion. In reality, the place was and still is full of desperate poverty and sickness. There wasn't a single hospital in Abu Dhabi until a few years ago, and doctors were hardly ever seen. Now there's this American mission hospital, overburdened, overcrowded, forced to compromise, like everything in Arabia, between modern standards and old habits. It's something that we have not wanted to exist, these patients being in all together. But we've been working on it, and we haven't come up with a good answer, uh, simply because we don't have enough staff to watch all the doors. We lock the front door, and they come in the back door or the side door. So we have gotten sort of used to it over the years, so that now we don't mind it much. When they're all in there together, it's their hard luck if they can't have the privacy of the personal examination of the doctor. The little children often have diarrheas or fever, colds and sores and abscesses and such to take care of. And then the local Arabs seem to have their share of accidents falling out of a palm tree or off of a camel. And they seem to be sort of dangerous. They may fracture a limb or break a hip. And most all of the people are suffering from eye ailments of one sort or another, from the youngest child to the oldest man, with the ailment of trachoma, which is about 99% uh, prevalent here. Many of them are suffering from tuberculosis. More and more we are detecting this disease as we go on with the x-ray. Uh, <coughs> تمام هذا تمام تمام هذا الحين نريد نفس صدري شوية ها ما رأيك بس من هني هم tradition still throws a veil around the women of Arabia that even the doctor can't quite penetrate his examinations here are probings in the dark وين يا أوري تاكتر أكتر هني شوي هني شو هذا هذا أوكل من أول وسم زي وسم the women are the most conservative force of all, secluded, unchanging, uneducated, and fatalistic. They accept their lot meekly, and they do their duty faithfully as the handmaidens and chattels of men. But for how much longer, when even under the thorn bush, the doctor arrives with his medicine, and every jab with a syringe becomes a sort of revolution? <laughs> Some of it may be still a bit like faith healing. No doctor's skill could have cured this man's tuberculosis. The most that medicine could do was to give him a sort of comfort on the way to death. <laughs> But if the 20th century medicine doesn't always work, it does challenge that submission to the will of God that accepts death whenever it likes to strike, 
so Islam itself comes under attack. God's will always seems more flexible when you can meet it with a millionaire's money. I'll be honored to present the estimates for Abu Dhabi for the year 1967. The total revenue, as estimated, is 41,202,080 dinars. <coughs> for the ruler, the days are over when he had so little money that nobody cared how he spent it. Now Zaid must have a budget and a British accountant to keep the books. Development expenditure is estimated at 23,275,671 dinars. Every penny is another nail in the coffin of the old Arabia, and maybe in the life of Zaid too. Dinar, you haven't included the um, airport building here, the, the airport, terminal building, have you? The airport you? building hasn't been tended for. It hasn't yet. been tended no. for. But you, this goes in the lump sum, does it? That goes in the lump sum of 10 million expenses. down here, uh -huh. yes. One, when I said that this included all the expenditure, there are things like the police, for instance, mm -hmm. where it's impossible to get a true estimate. We have to wait the arrival and the, of the new people to give us these estimates. I've put in a third of a million dinars for them to give them authority to spend. Outside Zaid's office, time still seems endless and patience still comes easily. His people have given up their lives to Allah. What God wills, they still accept. But the signs of dissolution are all around them, like the leisurely old world's cast-off furniture and the new office chairs that are waiting to take its place. As the offices grow, the people seem to shrink. When Zaid was simply the leader of a tribe, these men could meet him every day. Now he's the administrator of a modern state. He's forced to shut them out of his life. They can only wait while the world moves in, in a business suit. Even Zaid is a little less sure of himself. He can ask the new questions and make new demands, but who can give him the answers? You see his hands. For this year, of course, they're giving him something very approximate. Yeah. But uh, for next year's, he'd like it as precise as possible. Well, I'm hoping that the exercise in the coming year will give us the material for yes. next year, but at yes. the moment there's nothing to go on. <laughs> From their uncertainty about the new way of life, Zaid and his men go back to the desert as often as they can. The desert is still home, the place they knew before they were rich, and the only place they will really know until the day they die. In the desert for a day or a week or a month, they can go back to their old and simpler ways, to a genuine sense of comradeship that the modern world leaves no time for. There are no budgets and civil servants here. No plans, no figures, no complications, no closed office doors. There's the sky, the heat, the emptiness, and the infinity of time that they've always understood. Out here, they can all be sure of themselves again. They can relax and be men again. Or perhaps, being only men, they can just be boys. Even Zaid, the ruler, can let his hair down here and be one of the boys fighting a mock battle with his secretary. <laughs> On trips like this, the desert is an escape, a recovery of innocence, a return to Eden. But like all escapes, it's also an illusion. The innocence is lost and will never be recaptured, 
because the old Arabia of isolation, hardship and tribal war in which it flourished has been swept into the world at last. The unknown land has been more than just discovered. It's been uncovered in the past 10 or 20 years and dragged naked into everybody's sight. Of course, this doesn't mean that the old Arabia has disappeared in the space of the last few years. It's still a hard land that breeds a hard people. Tough individuals like Zaid and his men, and some of them still fighting a rearguard action against the assaults of the modern world. All the same, in the end, the 20th century brooks no defaulters. Here in Arabia, one of the last of the lonely lands is surrendering its old independence. From now on, its people will have to face, like the rest of us, the infinite hopes, possibilities and disillusionments of the modern universal world. <laughs> This has been NET Journal, a weekly look at the events, issues, and people of the world today. This is NET, the National Educational Television Network.